Welcome to Sustainability in Your Ear, the Earth911.com podcast for the week of March 23rd. Now, before I go continue on, let me say we record this a few days in advance. So as of March 23rd, do check your local information for any updates because we're going to talk about coronavirus and Earth Day. One of the things we're going to talk about with regard to coronavirus is how we can use this bad time, this disruption of our daily lives, maybe to establish some more sustainable lifestyles. And we're also going to talk about what are the plans for Earth Day in April this year in the face of the pandemic. So welcome, everyone. Uh, Mitch Radcliffe, our Earth 901 publisher. How are you today, Mitch? Well, I am actually recovering from what we believe was COVID-19, so I'm feeling better and uh, my family is feeling better, but it's uh, it's an icky flu for uh, those of you who don't have a, um, a serious uh, medical underlying medical condition. It's just an icky flu. All right. Well, we might get some more information on that in a few minutes. Uh, also, we have our Earth 901 writer, Sarah Lozanova. Sarah, how are you today? I'm doing all right, adjusting to dramatic changes in the last week or so. Yeah, so we were talking before we went online, you've got your daughter's school is out probably through April, but your son's school sounds like they haven't quite made up their minds yet as to whether they're coming back or not. Yeah, that's what they had said. I think they're, they wanted more time to evaluate things. Yeah. I've been really amazed at my daughter's school, though, how well they've prepared virtual school just in a matter of days and trying to make it as equitable as possible by giving out hotspots and laptops. Well, you're really fortunate to be in a region like that where uh, my wife teaches uh, school basically shut down and there is no distance learning because we can't provide uh, laptops or tablets and hotspots to kids who don't have them. And, and, and it's really fortunate for you that you do. Yeah, yeah. I'm really blown away by it. I live in mid coast Maine and they, even her teacher recorded stories. So the book that she had been reading to them, they can now listen to through their computers. That's great. Nice. Well, and we are coming to you from the lovely Moon Yard Studios, although all of us are remote now, as everyone is. Um, So we're missing out on that beautiful, sunny backyard of Doug's. Um, And yeah, I have to say in Tacoma, Washington, our, uh, you know, I don't have kids, but our students are not, um, not getting a lot of assistance at the moment. I think everyone's still trying to figure out what they're doing. So um, I'm hopeful that by next week, maybe they'll have some plans in, in place because right now I think it's kind of ad hoc up to every individual parent, just what they're doing with their kids. Yep. That is the case. And teachers are uh, basically on call right now for uh, three, three or so days a week, but uh, they're not being asked to do anything in terms of delivering um, remote learning. Yeah. So, Mitch, before we launch into talking about how, you know, we can use uh, coronavirus maybe as some teaching opportunities and changing Mm -hmm. our habits, tell me a little bit about your experience with COVID-19. How did you know that you had it or or thought that you were likely to have had it? Well, uh, the the, the whole experience was an exercise in dissonance and and frustration, frankly. Uh, The Mm -hmm. dissonance between what we were told was available and what was actually available. Um, we've had this in the house for almost uh, 10 days now. And um, it, it, it's a dry cough, uh, a, a very, very lethargic fever. Um, you know, you just feel like you have no energy whatsoever. And um, uh, various other uh, symptoms ranging from gastric to um, uh, headaches and the like, and body aches, particularly joint pain. But uh, what we found was that uh, even though we were told there were lots of tests and all of that, there were none whatsoever. I've spent uh, almost uh, five hours on hold waiting for a virtual doctor's visit that never materialized until the next morning when they called me, asked, my, uh, asked about the symptoms, and then said basically, well, first we'd test you for the flu, but we don't have enough flu tests to do that. And that would rule out the flu. And if you don't have the flu and you still have these symptoms, then we'll test you for COVID-19. Well, that's days of testing. And I thought the point was to capture the state of the the nation in terms of the infection rate. That's not going on at this point. And it's very, it's, 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 it, it makes you angry. Yeah. I think it's a combination of, you know, anger at the futility of it all. And then, you know, anxiety about what this means and, you know, how prevalent is this 
um, virus. Um, we just don't know. There's so much we don't know. Well, and, and we do know some things. It doesn't kill everybody who gets it. It kills very mm. few people who get it. Uh, unfortunately, it seems to uh, be the elderly and possibly the young. We're starting to hear uh, the very young. But um, and, and I don't want to spread any misinformation. I, I, I'm not an expert on this. On the other hand, uh, having you know lived through it, it's it's something where we're we're, we're like our ancestors, uh, going to come out of this stronger as a result of what we can learn. And if the if the COVID event has taught us anything. It's that all the small changes people are making all over the world are adding up to huge impacts on the environment, both positive and negative. The, um, uh, you know, the, the decline in, in air pollution over Italy and China, which has been well documented, shows that if everybody stops driving, pollution stops too. And we should take that as a strong sign that the kinds of small decisions we talk about, about being sustainable, can have a, a cumulative impact. impact. But on the other hand, you know, you've got this um, lack of information and, and uh, people reacting by going out and st uh, stockpiling or hoarding all sorts of materials that can be bad for us. So, you know, we also have to recognize the use of plastic in this environment mm -hmm. with gloves and like is a good thing, but it results in more plastic pollution. So we have to rethink our society. But this is probably the best opportunity to stop and look at it that are removed yeah. from our daily behavior that we've had in that, our entire lifetime. Yeah, I think that's true. So we have a, a good story. It looks like it's your story up on the website, Mitch, of use coronavirus to reset your life for sustainability. And I, I appreciate, I have to tell you, I'm not really in the most uh, optimistic, positive frame of mind at the moment. So I sort of appreciate this idea that, okay, you know, we're in the middle of this. One of the hard things is that you don't have a lot of control over what's going on. But what are some of the things that you can take from this and apply toward the future that, that could be lifestyle improvements? And this is the first of a series of articles that we'll be presenting. Um, but uh, what we what I realized as I looked at the environment is that we have to make something positive out of this. Uh, we can't simply live through it and ignore all the lessons that we could take away. And we looked at several areas that we clearly can see there's an impact. One is rationing toilet paper and paper towel usage. Uh, this country uses far more uh, toilet paper than any other country in the world by a factor of two uh, to the mm. next uh, in, in the world. And <clears throat> we could cut down. Uh, we can use less toilet paper, less toilet paper per visit to the bathroom. There's a lot of different ways to take uh, steps to do that, just counting sheets or simply not using toilet paper in all the circumstances you normally would, like blowing your nose. But, or bidets too, like right, using so, water instead. And and bidets would be another option. And, and in fact, we're putting together an article that lists, uh, that links to a bunch of good ideas, including an excellent uh, article uh, by CNET about bidets that you can install at home right now. And they start at like 50 or 60 bucks and they work well. But I've had a bidet in my home for years, and same thing. I actually have one that's just twenty five dollars. It's it just sprays cold water, but it's very effective, and you can put it right on your toilet. And yeah. um, it's it's a tiny bit of setup. You know, you've got to connect it to the water supply, but it's it's surprisingly easy, and it was twenty five. And, and as a consequence, you could cut down your toilet paper usage by at least half. And if you take the average number of toilet paper rolls a family of four buys and cut it in half, you're saving more than $320 annually. Now think about that. You're spending $640 on toilet paper over the course of a year if you're using 141 rolls as the regular, but normal, the average person does. So there's a lot of opportunity to save both the environment and your wallet that we can take uh, out of this that, that event. And we also looked at things like, you know, the commute. And, and we had a very timely response from a, customer, from a reader who said, you know, look, uh, this is true of people who work in offices, but not hourly workers. But I'm working remotely for the job that I have outside of this. Uh, everybody I know is. Uh, and this is a, an opportunity to rethink the way that we collaborate and, and, and work together. Uh, we don't necessarily have to travel to offices. Very 20th, 19th century and 20th century idea is that people have to get together to be productive. But in fact, 
that's not the case in an, in an environment supported by a telecommunications infrastructure like the one we have, although it's kind of teetering under this load too. Yeah. So we could look at well, changing that. I, you know, a word to that, you know, so whenever we do, I see this a lot on social media, whenever we start discussing, you know, one of the benefits is the reduced air pollution because people aren't driving to work as much. You do get someone who'll, who do the, does the whataboutism. Well, yeah, but what about the person who works in the service industry that has to be at work every day who, you know, maybe, um, you know, doesn't have that option. And that's absolutely true. But here's the thing. Mm -hmm. You know, we hear many, many, you know, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And this is one of those situations for those workers who can work from home, working from home, either all the time or a few days a week can make a significant difference. And it can really help balance out the fact that there are some people who cannot work from home. Now, those people may drive, they may take public transit, maybe they carpool, whatever it may be, there's still a net positive when those people who can work from home do work from home. And one of the things that will be a net positive coming out of this is that so many employers who have never quite made that adjustment will now have made the adjustment. I think it will be very difficult. And I work in state government. It'll be very difficult for any state agency a year from now to tell employees, I'm sorry, you cannot telecommute. You have to work here. Yeah. Yeah. Five days a week. I completely agree. And, and, you know, the thing is, if you look at the way that the pollution declined over Italy and China, they were measuring um, uh, nitrogen dioxide, uh, which is emitted by diesel and, and truck emissions primarily. So they can say this is really due to us not having trucks on the road or really due to the fact that people are not driving to and from work as much. And mm-hmm. that's a great trigger for all sorts of changes about the cost and benefits of various practices that we have today. We can, we can take this and look at it in terms of the trade-offs that we're making. We could have a cleaner environment and people could have a more flexible lifestyle. But hourly workers too, we can look at the fact that hourly workers, because they do have to be in person, maybe need to be paid more than we have thought they do. And that that yes. risk of being the hands-on mm-hmm. interface for the rest of the global economy is worth more money or has a should come with a, a, a social safety net that is actually robust rather than bare bones. There's a lot of ways to think about this. Another thing I've been thinking about in all of this is just how much so many of us travel. And I don't mean the daily commute, but mm-hmm. maybe it's because this was hitting in you know late February and March, but so many of the people I know were on vacation or were down in, you know, traveling for work or things like that. And so, so many people that I know have flown in the last couple of weeks, you know, and are kind of self-quarantining. But it, it may, it's, it's gotten me to just think about how much we travel in such long and, distances. And, and, and you can think about trips to the store, too, in that context. You can think about all the things that we do. Could we better plan how we go out and shop? Or could we change the way that we shop so that it is delivered when we need it? Uh, there are obviously a lot of details to how that could work. Uh, we know that um, on-demand travel, uh, you know, Uber and Lyft is not more efficient than regular travel. But if we did think about how to deliver things systematically, maybe we could lower our overall emissions. So there's a lot of ways uh, that we can take this to reduce food waste, that we can take this and reduce emissions, that we can reduce the the complexity and difficulty of earning a living in this country. Mm-hmm. And just helping each other out. Like I've been sending text messages to friends, especially elderly people or more vulnerable people when I go grocery shopping, because I'm thinking, well, hey, if I'm already going to be exposing myself at all, I may as well be shopping for two or three households then, you know, make it, make it worth it. Um, and then that saves emissions too, because we're not all making individual trips to the store, but just kind of looking out for our neighbors, looking out for our friends and trying to consolidate and reduce overall risk. I think and you know, that's, that's, that's an interesting idea of, of doing the shopping for other people, because one of the things we have in the infrastructure that's available today is the ability to parse out work differently so that you could be maybe compensated a little bit for doing that shopping it may not be cash. It may be that somebody else in your neighborhood takes care of preparing food for you once a week or something like that. And those trade-offs that we can do locally and that we can keep track of with digital technology, not in order to say, did you do enough for me, but in order to coordinate the activity, 
that's a really interesting way to come out of this with a new set of behaviors and practices that can be more sustainable. It's something that I've thought a lot about because I live in Belfast co-housing and eco village. And when I first moved in, my kids were two and five. So I had a much more limited ability to contribute to the community as a whole. You know, as it was a two and a five year old, you can barely weed your garden, you know, let alone, you know, facilitate a meeting or something. Yep. So, um, and many neighbors helped me with light childcare, you know, watching the kids for an hour here or there. But then I was also thinking like many, you know, it's a multi-generational community and may, many of these households have people in their 70s. So then when when the kids are a little bit older, then it's much easier for me to say, mow their lawn or buy them a bag of chicken feed or things that mm-hmm. might be hard for them to do. But I think relationships over time can kind of be cyclical where one one party gives more during one phase or maybe during an illness and then you know it's reciprocated later on in different ways and there are lots of ways to set this up you know and if you look at the long term care facilities where folks move in uh make a contribution or an investment and then they move from a home into a, a an assisted care facility into a full time care facility, and that's all planned into the twenty or thirty years they're going to spend in that retirement community. Uh, that's a model that we can think about for you, young families in communities as well. Now, there's a lot of different mm. interesting opportunities, but we can't panic. We have to look at this as, huh, everything's disrupted. Now we can rethink it. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think that's a good way to put, to put it. Definitely. Another interesting concept too is if if we were to apply some of these dramatic measures to climate change, we mm-hmm. could have make an overnight difference. You know, because at least over the last maybe twenty five or so years that I've really been paying attention to this to the climate issue, I keep saying, why aren't we doing something more dramatic? You know, and this is also sort of like a a test run for if we really do collectively decide let's take some serious action to combat climate change some of these measures are a good blueprint well and we also face the threat of at this point severely reduced oil prices so that it becomes more competitive with renewable energy as well as uh, the plastic industry arguing that plastic is the solution and so let's abandon some of our more sustainable goals Uh, we are seeing fallback uh, against our our climate goals all over the world as a result of this. And so we also need to be conscious of that. This isn't only an opportunity to do better. It's an opportunity to, to, to make calamitous decisions that are short-term rather than long-term. Let's take a look at that in terms of sort of global decision-making. We have Earth Day coming up. Um, mm-hmm. It's always on April 22nd. But this year, instead of a lot of organized, um, in-person, large group social behavior, we are being encouraged to be a little more socially distant and a little more active through our uh, online options. So, Mitch, you want to tell us a little bit about how Earth Day 2020 looks to be shaping up? Well, Earth Day 2020 is not only... um uh, happening during the coronavirus. It's the 50th anniversary of Earth Day's first event, uh, an event that that led to the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency, the Clean Air Act, and the Clean Water Act, which transformed the American environment. And the goal of the organization, Earth Day Network, uh, is to get a billion people out into the streets, or at least it was to get a billion people out into the streets uh, to protest and, and start to participate in cleaning up things. Unfortunately, because of coronavirus, we know that mass uh, events, uh, events with more than 10 people are generally discouraged. And uh, the Earth Day Network has come out with a plan to uh, virtualize, uh, go online with a lot of these beha- these activities so that we don't uh, endorse behaviors that will lead to widespread infection. Uh, but this is, this is a, a, a moment where uh, people can get together uh, and express their concern about uh, both the short and long-term decisions we're making today, both with regard to coronavirus and without. And so that uh, you can check out, we have a, an article on the uh, on Earth 911 uh, explaining how to participate in Earth Day. And if you go to earthday.org, you'll find uh, links and ongoing updates. This What we're recording today is not necessarily going to be the case, even when we release this a few days later. 
But uh, go to earthday.org and uh, check out what they have planned online. That includes strikes that will not involve leaving the office or the classroom, but submitting um, petitions and other kinds of activities like that. Or go out and do something alone in a park. Uh, You can do your social distancing and still clean up uh, uh, one of your parks. Uh, Just don't get together and give people hugs. And so the Earth Day program is designed this year, uh, you know, to to mobilize one seventh of the global population. But now we're going to have to do part of it online. I think it's an interesting opportunity for us to to kind of embrace this, because when I first heard about these types of announcements coming on, you know, basically things that would have been in-person events being virtual, my first thought is like, oh, that that can't be. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to participate in that. But I think there's really something to it, because if we want to get that kind of collective action, that's only possible, like that energy that's only possible in groups, if, if we can't meet in person now, the way to do it is virtually. So yeah. I, I encourage people to really embrace this and, um, and to see what we can create virtually. Well, and I think if you've got um, kids at home from school, this is exactly the type of activity that, that might be really helpful and help kind of focus a lot of energies and enthusiasm because you know, there's all kinds of information online. And I think every family can sort of figure out what is meaningful to me and how do I want to, you know, make my feelings about the earth and about protecting the earth known. Well, and so the thing to look for is EarthRise. It's a global call to action that Earth Day Network has put together, and you can uh, visit uh, earthday.org to find this. But this will be where um, all this mobilization is coordinated. Uh, Some of these will be physical events, but a lot of them are going to be virtual. And uh, we check that out. It's at earthday.org slash EarthRise for Earth Day Take Action. Well, let's talk a little more. Sarah, you had a great story about preparing sustainably for coronavirus. Can you tell us what we should be thinking about? Yeah, it's it's an interesting thing because I think many of us feel this panic and feel the need to just go to the store and stock up and clear the shelves of toilet paper, which you've already addressed, which is great. But um, one thing that I think is really important is to just think about what you actually need, what, what's important. And, um, you know, take a deep breath, maybe offer to help neighbors go at the same time, combine trips, um, still try to support your local farmer's market. Like I know, um, our local farmer's market moved outside already, you know, to try to encourage, you know, social distancing and prevent the spread of, of germs. But I think as much as possible trying to to continue to buy locally, um, support local farmers. Um, Another thing too is just to think about perishability, you know, because if you go out and buy a bunch of lettuce, you know, within a week or so, it's going to be past its prime. But certain veggies keep much longer. So if you're making less frequent trips to the store, things like um, potatoes, squash, carrots, onions, you know, all the root crops keep a lot longer too. So I think those are helpful things to keep in mind. You think it's a good idea to make large batches of food at this time and, and uh, save, you know, whether it's freeze or refrigerate them for later use or is that wasteful? I don't think so. I think like you said, as long as you preserve it, I know sometimes if I make a big batch of soup, if I don't freeze part of it, it'll often go bad. But a lot of us now are home all day and are not eating at all in restaurants or at friends' homes. So that I think can be an effective strategy. And I think it might be helpful for some folks that aren't used to cooking so many meals. I'm, I'm just kind of in awe over all the dirty dishes and all the effort that's going into eating for, for a household right now. So I think that could be a good, a good strategy for streamlining things. Yeah, Another thing. You. Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Well, I was going to say, I think you have to really know what your eating habits are because I, I, I grew up in a household with, you know, with four kids, three younger brothers. And so I tend to naturally make too much food and Mm. it's okay. It's okay. As long as I, you know, then can take leftovers to work, to eat at lunch or something like that. But I, um, 
but I've noticed when we're home, we don't tend to be as good about eating our leftovers. So I have to be a little bit more careful about making sure either it's something that we're really going to eat or it's something that I can freeze for a later dinner um, or I need to reduce my, um, my preparations because I tend to cook enough for at least four to six people when there are only two of us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think, you know, even in these scary times, it's, it's really great to reduce waste and be efficient with, mm-hmm. with what we have. Well, you, also another- pointed, you also pointed out another thing and, and that is uh, keeping in mind what's toxic and not toxic when we're keeping safe. And you, you called out in particular triclosan, which is a, um, uh, an ingredient in hand sanitizers that's not um, approved by the Food and Drug Administration. What are you What are you seeing in terms of of opportunities to be um, less or, or to be toxic free as as we prevent this virus? Well, one thing that we've been using in our community a lot, and I've seen some CDC research saying that it's effective, is using peroxide. I think it's easy to think I'm just going to get the most toxic brew to spray and that'll just kill everything. But that isn't necessarily a good strategy. Although the EPA did put out some information and um, they basically were recommending certain commercial products, but they didn't evaluate peroxide. But I've, I've been using peroxide a lot. Um, we haven't been able to get hand sanitizer for a while here. Um, so I'm looking into making homemade hand sanitizer, um, but you need to be careful to make sure that it has enough rubbing alcohol or alcohol in it basically to be effective. But Mm -hmm. um, I think making some homemade products can be helpful, but you also do want to, what I've been doing is looking to reputable sources. So if I do make it, then I know, okay, it needs to have this percentage of this or that to be, to be effective. Um, And also like with spraying peroxide, what I, what I've, heard is the most effective is to spray it and then to not wipe it off. Just let it so, dry. So I've been cleaning surfaces first and then spraying and letting mm-hmm. it dry. Exactly. Um, mm-hmm. So I think kind of switching up some of the ways that we clean can be helpful. Yeah, I think the hand sanitizer is a really um, focal point because I, I see um, plenty of people online who are who are complaining they're unable to find hand sanitizer. And they just, and it's not really available. And I've never been a big fan of hand sanitizer. I just I don't like it. Um, but um, there are recipes online for making it. Um, but you're right. You have to be really careful that you get the right kind of alcohol in it. That's a, a high enough proof alcohol. Uh, I thought that regular vodka and uh, aloe vera gel would be sufficient, but it's not. You need to get um, either rubbing alcohol or possibly. Um, some high proof alcohol from the liquor store, but I haven't gone that far yet. I have the uh, and, aloe vera uh, gel. And unfortunately there are um, distilleries out there that are using this as an opportunity to spread their brand, but not necessarily useful hand sanitizer. So they're, you know, they're, they're, mm-hmm. they're providing something that is a mix of their alcohol and aloe, but that isn't necessarily going to be sterile. No. I mean, I, I, I guess it's better than nothing, you know, it might, it might take some of the, of the things off of your hands, but my understanding is, is that the, you know, the value of soap when you're washing your hands is it dissolves the exterior lipid barrier that the actual little tiny microviruses have. So it actually destroys Mm -hmm. the virus cells. And I think that the, you know, 99% alcohol or the high alcohol may do something similar, but, you know, just, it it will. Uh, yeah. But if somebody's using a sixty or a sixty or ninety proof uh, alcohol to make this hand sanitizer, as compared to a hundred and eighty proof uh, alcohol, that's that's the kind of mistakes that yeah. will get people behaving like they are sterilized, but not when they are not. Yeah. yeah. So Sarah, what about keeping care of ourselves? Because that's one that we can do. You you wrote about boosting the immune system. Yeah, I think this is a really important thing to consider because the stronger our immune system is, then we can, you know, I'm I'm no doctor, but it makes sense that if you can, if you do get sick, if you can shorten the period that you're sick and shorten, you know, decrease the severity of it, that that could really have um, beneficial effects. So some of the things that seem especially helpful are um, elderberry syrup. I was looking at studies about how that can help shorten both the intensity and duration of a viral infection. So um, it's recommended to take that with the first 
onset of symptoms, or I've heard of a lot of people just taking it proactively uh, to to boost the immune system. How do you Another, get elderberry juice? It's made out of the berries of an elderberry bush. I actually grow it in my, my yard. There are these dark colored kind of- Are there commercial purple. options? There yeah, are. you can buy a bottle of it. Um, they, it can come in capsules too. From my experience, I've found the liquid more effective. But okay. yeah, um, local grocery stores, pharmacies. The problem is a lot of places are out of it now. Um, mm-hmm. I happen to have some, and I stocked up a few weeks ago when I first started getting nervous about this. But even um, drugstore, national drugstore chains now often carry it if mm-hmm. if they're not out of it. Mm-hmm. But um, I noticed there were some at a local um, food co-op last week. Um, it's it's pretty expensive. Well, you know, a lot of these uh, you know specialty. Um, products are. I think it was about $18 for a bottle that looked like it was about an eight ounce bottle. Mm -hmm. And it's about a teaspoon or so. It it depends. Mm. You should read the label. Um, But with the ones that I've taken, it's about a teaspoon per dose and you can take multiple doses a day, but definitely read the bottle because it can vary by the product. Yeah. And then some of the other things that I think could be really helpful are just kind of common sense things like try to get enough sleep, even though it might be a stressful time, try to, you know, be disciplined and get to bed on time. And well, at least we don't have to be at work. Right. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Although we might be up half the night reading the news headlines. Mm -hmm. The media is, have some of the stories are just unbelievable that are coming out right now. Drinking enough water to proper hydration is another thing that can really help zinc which is a mineral it might be in like a multivitamin or multi-mineral supplement or another great source of it is eating pumpkin seeds mm-hmm. so well, and i think yeah th- th- there's those and in, in getting out you you do talk about getting out and getting 10 to 30 minutes of uh, sun exposure a couple of times a few times a week and, and doing that is still possible even with social distancing so uh, one of the best things we can do is go for a walk Absolutely. And I hope it gets, it doesn't get to that point where some of the cities where they're telling people to stay inside. And even if it does get to that point, maybe sitting on a balcony or, or mm-hmm. things like that. Yeah. 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 That's one thing that's really nice about living in a rural area is that the great outdoors are, are right, right there for us. And there's so few people around. The, the outdoors are outdoors. Yeah. The outdoors are just right outside. <laughs> Well, we have been very lucky, you know, at least during this week, we've had remark in Washington state with a remarkably nice weather so that it has been sunny. And I have noticed a, a lot of people out walking their dogs and, and taking a run. So I, I think that's helping as much, much better than if we were in one of those periods of constant downpour rain. Yeah, that is helpful. And I think if people are really concerned about being around others, it won't necessarily help from a vitamin D standpoint, but for getting outdoors, you can always go real early or, you know, at times where there's going to be fewer people out. Yeah. Just uh, don't stop and shake hands and hug. And I think we're okay in this situation, but you know, and, and, and we're, we're kind of hemming and hawing about this now because we also really don't know our answers because this is a completely novel situation. And, you know, that's, I, I want to thank both of you for thinking through all of this with us as we talk about uh, what we're going to do, because this has been, a really useful conversation for me. Well, good. Great. Well, anything else you want to bring up, Mitch, before we go into earthling questions? Well, we have been doing more interviews because there's not much else to do. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) And uh, we uh, have a a nice piece uh, earlier uh, last week on uh, de-icing sustainably. Uh, We talked with uh, PlaySafe, which is a maker of a a rock salt free de-icer and salt in our groundwater is a big problem in, in communities that use a lot of rock salt. So uh, something that we uh, I encourage people to listen to. And also uh, an interview with Dr. Anita Sanchez, who wrote a book called the four gifts of indigenous uh, 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 four gifts and it's lessons from indigenous living uh, for the times that we live in. And both were really good conversations about what uh, you can do to make your life uh more sustainable and, and uh, 
it's a good way to spend some time. So I hope you uh, all check it out. We also have uh, interviews coming up with the Earth Day Initiative, which is the New York City uh, program that will, uh, that is in the midst of changing its plans. Uh, we are going to be talking about um, uh, interesting ideas in financing sustainably sourced materials uh, and how consumers can use that information to pick better choices when they're shopping. And uh, the other thing I'd want to call out is in this time, we are welcoming uh, businesses, small businesses and sustainable businesses to uh, uh, to come and enter information on the Earthling Forum about the things that they provide, whether it's locally or nationally or internationally, so that people are able to start to connect to those sustainable options. So check out the Earthling Forum if you haven't dropped by. It's getting busier all the time, and we hope that this is a good time for you to participate. We have a couple of interesting um, Earthling questions. Um, First of all, it sounds like we've received a number of requests this week about recycling pill bottles, um, which is a good idea. And so we do have um, information on the website. Go to, you know, earth901.com slash inspire slash DIY and then slash reused pill bottles. Search for reused pill bottles and you'll have some really good information about that. Yeah, we had a lot of people ask this question uh, this week. I think everybody's thinking about their prescriptions and and all that waste. Uh, And we have for a long time been pointing to Matthew 25 Ministries, which is a humanitarian aid and disaster relief organization that takes empty plastic pill bottles and turns them uh, uh, for reuse, uh, uh, sending uh, medicines uh, often overseas, or they will shred and recycle them responsibly if they have too many of them. And so uh, Matthew 25 Ministries is a great way to repurpose your pill bottles. And since more than 70% of us take at least one prescription a day, it's something that every one of us gets 10 to 12 bottles of pills and can use to, to reduce our, our footprint. Yeah. I think that's a really good plan. And uh, most of the pill bottles are not things that your recycler wants to have, um, either because they're difficult to recycle or because of concerns of uh, what may have been contained within that bottle. So the the reused pill bottle information is very helpful. Uh, Kathleen on Facebook asks, where can clothes that are stained, ripped, et cetera, that are not usable be donated rather than thrown in the trash? Well, first off, we have an answer to this. It's a general article, a guide, how to recycle clothing and accessories. So search for how to recycle clothing on the site, and you'll get uh, a lot of information about how to uh, pick where to send materials. Uh, We don't actually suggest you send things to Goodwill. Uh, We've had conversations with them, and they have literally millions of pounds of textiles that they cannot dispose of and are looking to recycle. Um, uh, but there are not a lot of textile recyclers. So it's probably a better idea to go to a local clothing or resale shop and donate your clothes there. Uh, and in some cases, possibly even sell your clothes there. But those, uh, what, what Kathleen asked about is, is clothes that are not really reusable. That is something that um, uh, you can send through in some transfer stations. They will take uh, textiles and process them responsibly. But in, for the most part, you have to send them for reuse. And that's uh, the first step uh, is to visit the article and and understand what your options are locally. Yeah, I think that's a really good idea. Yeah, you know, it used to be that Goodwill said, send us everything because they did have some places that they were um, sending for rags and things like that. But I'm not sure that is still the case. No, it's it's literally the, the case that they have warehouses full of materials and can't get rid of. What a shame. Um, Charles in Aurora, Illinois says, uh, I'm concerned. I like this question. I am concerned about the sacks in cereal boxes. I don't know what they're made of, but I'd like to recycle them instead of throwing them in trash. Well, what do you know about those sacks, Mitch? First off, having spent a lot of my youth in Aurora, Illinois at my grandparents' house, I was happy to see the question. Uh, sacks and cereal boxes are made of HDPE, which is a number two plastic. And they can be recycled, but a lot of recycling programs avoid them because they're a film and they can jam machinery. So you need to uh, take these 
either to a transfer station. Uh, you can't put them in your uh, bin in most locations in the United States. So you take them to a transfer station and put them in the number two plastic bins. The other thing you can do, and this is something if you, particularly if uh, you're going through a lot of uh, cereal, is uh, go to this TerraCycle site and look for their zero waste box, which has a, uh, in which you can put HDPE bags, these number two plastic bags and cereal boxes, and then send the box in when it's full. And that's something that has a price. Uh, you know, you're paying TerraCycle to responsibly recycle this stuff, but you will have it taken care of. And so we strongly urge you to take a look at the uh, TerraCycle zero waste box. Uh, now, there are local options in Aurora uh, that do accept uh, the, the bags, and you can search on the search.earth911.com site to get those that information. We shared this with uh, Charles by uh, mail as well. But uh, there are options for those bags. They are recyclable, but it takes a little bit of work. And I will say this, and this is something that Doug um, tipped me off to one of the last times we talked about recycling things. These bags inside cereal boxes, and we uh, have a type of granola that we like, and mm-hmm. so we have quite a few of these. They are so strong, and they are yeah. like glued together with, I don't know, you know, some industrial grade epoxy that nobody can ever tear apart. I mean, literally the only way I get in is by cutting them with scissors. I cut half of it off, and then when we're done with the cereal, I cut the whole top of them off, and I save them. And these are the most fantastic bags for sandwiches, yep. for you know, anything that needs to go, that you're going to go in the freezer, but you want to have things separately wrapped. Like I'll wrap up um, bacon or other things in the cereal bags and then put them into a freezer bag. These are really, really good food storage bags. I mean, they last and they're very sturdy. So um, think about whether you could want to reuse them in your own household as well as recycling them. Great point. And, uh, uh, you know, reuse is, is always the best first step. If you can get two or three uses out of any material uh, before you throw it away, that's a, those, those are important differences. Well, anything else, Mitch, before we close up today? Everybody stay safe, stay sane. Um, these, these times will pass. All right. Well, thank you for listening to Sustainability in Your Ear. If you have thoughts or ideas or ideas uh, for us to uh, focus on in the future, you can send us email. Uh, Send us email, feedback at earthnone1.com, or you can uh, send us comments on Facebook as well and any other social media. And, of course, uh, catch our podcasts on iTunes, SoundCloud, Spreaker, iHeartRadio, YouTube, and always directly at our earthnone1.com website. We will see you next time. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody.